to speak few words uh this was sir Sir, I think Sir has not joined it. Okay, uh, we'll, 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 uh, we'll request Sir to address the people in between the session. And uh, I may request uh, Gayatri Madam, Assistant Professor Civil Department, to introduce uh, our today's speaker, Gayatri Madam. Thank you, Sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gayatri, as working as an Assistant Professor in Civil Engineering. in sri venkateshwara college of engineering today i would like to tell a, a few words about our guest dr tadepalli parnama tejeshwi garu dr tadepalli garu he is currently an assistant professor of nit warangal since 2014 he has a background in structural engineering and mechanics his areas of expertise include structural dynamics non linear finite element analysis composite material vibration testing photo elastic testing high strain rate testing shock testing multi scale modeling micro mechanics and non destructive evaluation he works in the area of experimental characterization and analytic modeling of material and structure response to shock and high strain rate loading as an assistant professor at university of mississippi usa dr tadepalli coordinated the setup and operations of a shock tube based blast testing simulator which simulate blast phenomenon in the laboratory accurately without the need of dangerous cnt and explosive chemicals as well as split hop kinson bar system for high strain rate testing of materials at university of mississippi dr tadepalli garu also worked on the development of novel computational modeling methodologies to predict multi scale behavior of cementious material under ballistic and shock loading conditions dr tadepalli garu has previously worked as a senior engineer in hinman consulting engineers san francisco ca where his job was his job responsibilities included blast vulnerability assessment hazard mitigation and retrofit design for various facilities and infrastructure technical guidance to engineers proposal writing technical innovation and development of novel analysis procedure dr tade palligaru has also worked as the project engineer of and he sit at uscsd which is a national network and involved working with a variety of researchers from various universities across the us for managing earthquake engineering and structural response data from laboratory experiments as well as hybrid simulations dr tade palligaru obtained his phd in 2009 from the university of mississippi his area of research was multi hazard that is blast seismic and wind vulnerability assessment of reinforced concrete frame building structure he obtained his ms in 2003 where in he de, wherein he developed fea software based on a novel analytical methodology for modeling the linear dynamic and non linear quasi static response of mechanically joint structures composed of pulsed uh, composite sections dr tadai pilgaru has publications in various journals and is also a reviewer of uh, journal of composites b journal of uh, composite materials journal of intelligent material systems and structures journal of vibration and control and journal of sandwich composites and materials he holds a us patent and has an eit certification from michigan uh, 
he is a member of ASME, ASE, ASC, APS, and Chai Epsilon Honor Society. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gayatri, madam. What a nice introduction. Uh, sir, on behalf of Department of Civil Engineering, on behalf of SVCT College Management, sir, I am very thankful to you, sir, for accepting our invitation and be, to be present here and uh, present your topic on health monitoring of structures. And uh, we are very happy to hear you, sir. And uh, we are all eager to hear your lesson, sir. Um, may I request you to start the session, sir? So before sir uh, commences the session, I request participants keep your mic muted and keep your doubts uh, to be asked at the end of the session. And uh, there is no chat box provided. So if at all you have any question, you can type in WhatsApp chat or reserve your question with you and you can ask the question at the end of the session, sir. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Tejas. Please start your session, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Chakravarti Garu. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, college administration of SVIT also for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, structural health monitoring. Um, so I will begin my presentation. Um, basically, uh, just want to see if I can share my screen. Screen sharing is on. Okay. Is my screen aware? Uh, uh, is it visible to everyone? Uh, it is loading, sir. Yes, it is visible, sir. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, um, so, today I'll be talking about the health monitoring of structures. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about the, uh, I'll be giving a brief introduction as to why structural health monitoring is required. Uh, and what, what are the technologies that enable us to do structural health monitoring? What are the processes that enable uh, gathering of the data? What are the challenges that are uh, still to be you know, um, solved, as problems to be solved? And what are the challenges in implementing uh, structural health monitoring? And uh, we will look at a few case studies and we'll also talk about uh, the future in terms of what codes of practice and standards are required for structural health monitoring, and what are the research needs. So in the beginning, uh, we'll talk about why we need structural health monitoring. So uh, basically all, um, it, all structures uh, degrade. And we want to know, uh, you know, because of uh, corrosion, fatigue, erosion, you know, overloads, uh, until they are not, uh, you know, no longer fit for use. Uh, and uh, either we can uh, repair it or we, you know, uh, look at a uh, number of actions that can be taken. Uh, one is to wait until the structure breaks and dispose it off. And other is to wait until the structure breaks and repair it. And other is to actually look at uh, periodic intervals and determine whether we can do any remedial action. Uh, this is where uh, we have to look into the cost of the uh, repair as well as cost of uh, the, uh, the importance of the structure or the criticality of the structure. So this is just a few examples of deterioration all around us that happens, continually happens. And that brings us to the fact that structural health monitoring has to be done regularly over a longer time span uh, in order to mo monitor our infrastructure. So the benefits are that we, you know, we'll have to, we can avoid uh, catastrophic failures, you know, loss of human life, and then optimal usage of the structure is allowed and uh, minimum, uh, you know, maintenance downtime is achieved. And then uh, the uh, human, uh, you know, we can, when we can replace the scheduled and periodic maintenance, it, is, it helps in reduction in the, uh, of the human element and human labor in, uh, in terms of uh, you know the downtime and errors is also reduced and improved safety and reliability of the structures is achieved by continual and constant structural health monitoring. So ideally, a uh, ideal structural health monitoring system should be low cost. It should have continuous assessment. Uh, it would be able to detect low levels of damage. And also it should be able to take uh, and detect different types of damage. Uh, it should be insensitive to the noise uh, that is coming and it should be insensitive to uh, 
uh, you know, various types of loading conditions. It also should be insensitive to environmental condition changes, meaning as the structure gets degraded, it should uh, be able to uh, measure the degradation of the structure and the system itself, the structural health monitoring system or framework itself should not get degraded. So we'll talk about so many things. Um, so basically, um, uh, the, uh, we have to have uh, a record of the specific environmental conditions. What is the demands on the structure? What are the ambient temperatures? What were the design assumptions which were uh, done? So structural health, uh, health monitoring can help in improving in the design and management of infrastructure in several ways. So we can do, you know, uh, validate uh, designs and see how they perform for futures uh, in order to design similar structures in the future. And uh, inspections can be scheduled on a as needed basis. So once we have a framework for structural health monitoring, we have some sort of control on the structure as to, you know, a regular, uh, um, regular observation of the structure. And once we have that regular observation, we can uh, establish certain thresholds uh, which can provide warning. So in, let's say certain deflections or certain outwardly visible cracking or spalling or rusting, uh, these sort of things are some changes in their properties of the structure, uh, which come up as anomalies when we are looking at a structure from a long time these are easily detected in comparison. So this is there is a lot of relative amount of data that is required uh, for comparison of the current status with respect to the previous one. And also in terms of disasters and extreme events, we can get real-time safety assessment post, for example, after an earthquake, whether a bridge is still uh, you know stable or a building is stable or whether a dam is still operable. These sort of things, uh, questions can be answered by structural health monitoring systems. And uh, the accuracy of the performance uh, assessment uh, is improved. And we can also look at a lot of, all these benefits are towards improved human safety, right? And most of these structural health monitoring technology has been started off from, you know, structural collapses. Uh, so even, uh, the we'll talk about various levels of structural health monitoring strategies. The lowest being the detection of damage. Even that is very beneficial uh, if you have enough early warning. Uh, and uh, automation of the structural health monitoring system will enable you know, increased safety in places where humans cannot be available 24-7. So, and which may have been neglected in visual inspections. So such things which uh, can be detected uh, by automated systems um, are also benefits. So what are the various elements of structural health monitoring system? Um, firstly, part of the system is the structure itself that has to be monitored. Um, and then we are all familiar with the sensors, uh, which are of, there are various types of sensors. Uh, then we have data acquisition systems, data transfer and storage systems, signal processing, um, algorithms for that and we have data handling and management systems and also damage modeling and damage detection systems the numerical modeling portion of the structural health monitoring uh, field um, and then the primary components uh, which in sort of way uh, also objectify the requirement for SHM is diagnosis and prognosis so in diagnosis, we look at uh, what is the damage. And in prognosis, we look at the severity of the damage and how, how much life does the structure still have. So structural health monitoring is a multidisciplinary subject and there is a lot of requirements. It is a lot of cross field data that is required information and knowledge that has to be transferred from at least four different subjects, uh, you know, mechanics, materials, electronics, and this is applied towards condition-based monitoring. You have novel non-destructive evaluation techniques, new modeling techniques are required, new sensor techniques are required for development. So all these go into structural health monitoring. So an understanding of mechanics, materials, and electronics is essential. 
for structural health monitoring. So uh, we start off with what is a sensor? You know, the definition of the sensor is that it's a device uh, that responds to a physical stimulus. You give it a temperature, pressure, stress, strain, whatever, it responds and gives out a signal. Uh, and a transducer is a specific type of device that converts energy from one form into another form. And an actuator is a device capable of performing a physical action or actuation. So uh, we look at these uh, in detail. So a sensor in the most uh, broad definition is an electronic component whose purpose is to detect and uh, uh, you know, pass on that information. So uh, in order to detect and pass on the information, it needs other electronics, you know, uh, something like, you know, a small, uh, signal amplification or even a Wheatstone bridge uh, or something as complex as a computer is required to get and measure the signals. So the sensor doesn't, uh, is not a sort of a standalone thing. It has to have its framework behind it. So a sensor converts the physical parameter into a signal, electrical signal, which can be measured. Um, <clears throat> And this is a just an overview of various types of sensors that are available. You have lots of acoustic uh, sensors, light sensors, pressure sensors, velocity, humidity sensors, uh, acceleration sensors, displacement sensors. Um, and then the basic, uh, this is a schematic diagram of a typical uh, sensor system, uh, wherein you convert the measured physical quantities of whatever measured physical quantity, stress, strain, deformation, temperature, humidity, uh, whatever. And then it is converted by the transducer into a electrical or optical excitation, which is again read by the uh, interfacing electronic circuit, which may have a signal conditioner, uh, which may have a, a band pass, high pass or low pass filter in it. Then you have a transmission circuit, you have a uh, signal amplification and process, uh, processing. Uh, and then you get an output of an analog or a digital signal, which when measured against a baseline gives you a indication of the current status of the sensor. So these are various types of sensors. This is a, a temperature sensor. It's the most common one is the thermocouple, which is based on the differential properties of two metal, uh, two metals. And the, the because of a differential temperature, electric circuit, electric uh, current is generated within the between the two electrodes, and then uh, that is uh, calibrated with temperature. We have speed sensors, we have ultrasonic sensors which measure the sound, uh, we have a photo infrared sensors which measure the infrared uh, received and transmitted light. And the classification of sensors is in itself a huge field, uh, wherein we look at the what is the primary input quantity, also called the measurant, uh, that is to be measured. Uh, what are the, they are classified on the basis of the transduction principles, the various transduction principles that are part of it. Uh, what are the various materials and technologies? What are the various properties? And what are the, in fact, what are the various applications also? Uh, or define the classification of sensors. So in terms of uh, primary uh, input quantity, which is the measurement, we have various physical quantities like temperature, pressure, flow, level, proximity or displacement, acceleration, light, you know, what is, for example, some gas or chemical flow or a chemical species detection. <clears throat> And in terms of application, we have industrial and non-industrial application. Industrial application is very familiar, um, the chemical engineers and metallurgical material science, pharmacy engineers, pharmaceutics people. Uh, they'll be very familiar with process control, measurement, automation. Uh, in a factory setting, and in a non-industrial setting, we have health monitoring wherein we are looking at the current, uh, you know, the life of a residual life of a structure or the current status of an automotive aircraft or even healthcare industry, wherein we look at uh, sensors which measure, uh, you know, things like heart rate, pulse, you know, brain activity, uh, things like that. 
So sensors can be classified uh, on the basis of power or energy also, energy supply requirement. Uh, so we, on that basis, we have the active and passive sensors. Active sensors obviously uh, require a, a power supply, uh, and uh, whereas passive sensors do not require any power supply. So we have accelerometers, uh, biosensors, image sensors, motion detectors. These are all having a plethora of uh, applications and uh, requirements. Uh, so also uh, sensors are uh, classified on the basis whether they, they, are, they can be embedded in the structure or they can be attached to the surface of the structure or they are non-contact uh, sensors. And the, when we choose a sensor, we would like to choose something that provides us accuracy and that there are certain features. Um, we have to look at the environmental condition. What are the limits of temperature and humidity in which the sensor is going to be placed? What is the measurement range of the sensor? And we also have to calibrate uh, periodically. For example, nowadays in COVID, we see people at the gate putting thermometers, right? And most of the cases, the thermometers may or may not be calibrated properly. Uh, the other day, I got a temperature of uh, 94 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very, very, very low. Uh, that is good for me, but if there is somebody with COVID, suddenly they will, uh, even if they have fever, they will show normal. So the calibration of temperature is very important. So the calibration of sensors of any sort is extremely important, not just the range or the accuracy. The calibration uh, eventually decides whether the sensor gives good data or not. Uh, and then the resolution, the smallest increment detected by the sensor should should also be uh, within the, uh, uh, it should provide us the information which we want, which we seek. The sensor should be cost effective and also the repeatability, uh, linearity of the sensor within the range uh, which we are measurement of doing. Uh, those should be um, uh, quite, uh, it should be linear and repeatable. So a good sensor always uh, is sensitive to the measured property. It is insensitive to any other property. It does not influence the measured property. For example, you don't put a sensor on a structure and it should not change the dynamic properties of the structure or the stiffness properties of the structure itself. It should be, it should not influence the measured properties. Uh, most uh, sensors have uh, a linear uh, transfer function, meaning there's a linear relation uh, which can be calibrated from the signal to the physical quantity that, that is being measured. So then sensitivity is the ratio between the output signal and the measured property. So the sensitivity, for example, uh, if a sensor measures uh, temperature and has a voltage output, you can give sensitivity in terms of uh, volts per Kelvin, um, and which is the slope of the curve. And uh, so, we can have uh, sensors uh, which, you know, analog uh, to digital signals, uh, various types of signals are there and lots of uh, signal processing equipment is also available um, for those. So there are certain things uh, in terms of range, uh, which is always limited for sensor. The output signal will reach a maximum or a minimum eventually beyond which the sensor cannot work. So the full range scale uh, defines the maximum minimums for the measured property. And sensitivity uh, is there is a, if there is an error in the slope of the linear transfer function, um, it shows us the sensitivity of the, of the sensor. And if the, uh, there might be a bias, right, there might be a set bias uh, voltage or a DC voltage above which, you know, everything is, uh, is a offset. And then there is, we are also worried about the non-linearity of the sensor. So how much does it deviate from the linear uh, linearity of the relationship between the measured uh, physical parameter and the output signal? So usually we assume that we design the sensor such that it is linear within the range of interest. Um, and then we have things like dynamic error, drift, and of course, there is noise. 
So in drift, what happens is that the long-term uh, measured property, the, the output signal slowly changes. Uh, it might be a sinusoid, but now the sinusoid starts to go up uh, slowly. And then that is called drift. It happens over a long time. Uh, and then noise is random over which most of us, we don't have any control on that. Then there's also hysteresis, which affects the repeatability of the, of the sensor. Um, and then there is also something called quantization error, which is basically round off error. Uh, because the signal, if, if the digital, if the sensor has a digital output, it is rounding off to a certain decimal place. That's called quantization error. And there might be some sort of sampling error, which causes, you know, that uh, um, if the sampling, there's a difference in sampling between the rate at which the sensor samples and the rate at which the data acquisition system works, we may have something called the aliasing errors. And then a sensor may be affected by other properties uh, other than what we are measuring. For example, in strain gauges, typically we measure uh, strain caused due to loading, but if there is a temperature raise, uh, raise in temperature, it also, the strain gauge also gets affected by the increase in temperature. So it's also effectively measuring the temperature also which we don't want, in fact, we want to avoid such um, extraneous effects on the sensors. So, and then we talked about resolution, which is the smallest change the sensor can detect. Uh, and then there's a difference between uh, resolution and precision uh, um, in which the measurement is made. Um, so a sensor's accuracy may be very worse than its uh, resolution. In many ways. So these are various types of sensor technologies. Uh, we have, you know, based on ceramic oxides, electromagnetic, what sort of physics uh, and what sort of sensor type and what sort of measurement type and physical uh, physical principle and what are the various uh, reliability issues uh, with each uh, sensor. These are well established uh, in literature and still a lot of research is ongoing. Uh, especially from mechanical, electromechanical, and electronics people, uh, and also material science people. This is an active area of research. Uh, so, and then we have the uh, various uh, sensor types and their uh, ranges, measuring range and the measurement accuracy. What are the resolution? For example, uh, at a triaxial servo type uh, accelerometer, which measures acceleration in three perpendicular directions. Uh, might have a resolution of one micro uh, micro g, which is uh, 10 to the power of minus six uh, into 9.81 meters per second square, and it's measuring at an a sample of a sampling rate of 100 hertz. So it is making one measurement every one hundredth of a second. So that sort of and it gives out a voltage, uh, which is an analog signal. So this particular type. So there are so many different types of uh, sensors and measurements. Uh, there's a huge amount of, even this list is not sufficient uh, to what I'm showing. So, and then there are sensors for monitoring the environmental factors, right? Uh, temperature, corrosion, uh, humidity, uh, resistivity, uh, these sort of things, uh, you know, chemical species uh, detection, things like that. So the, in this, uh, most of the cases, uh, uh, the sampling rates are a bit lower then the uh, you see what happens is as the as there is more randomness we and less control over it we also uh, look at slower and slower uh, kind of uh, sampling rates we'll discuss about that later so in structural health monitoring strategies we have uh, the global monitoring and the local monitoring of the systems in global monitoring what happens is that we are looking at the overall deformations, frequency variations, changes in the mode shape, modal parameters, are there any acoustic emissions, what is the, you know, the physical integrity, uh, these sort of things. And then at the local, we also have, you know, we're looking at the capacity of the member, the corrosion, cracking, is there cracking happening? What is the physical integrity? So there is some overlap. And in terms of uh, measurements also, there is, uh, in, um, local, we are looking at local monitoring, we are looking at deformations, electrochemical, environmental measurements, fatigue. And in the global, we are looking again at deformations and displacement, but at a global level, and we look at acceleration, deflection, you know, uh, 
uh, things like we can use piezometric uh, sensors for finding out the strain levels or the stress levels at a given location, or the uh, acoustic sound pressure emitted by uh, doing a cracking process. So as a rule of thumb, uh, we generally, uh, in low frequency applications, that is from zero to 10 hertz, um, for position and displacement measures, uh, the sensors give very good accuracy. Uh, and for velocity measurement, we usually need um, with a high frequency because uh, there is a lot more variation of up to one kilohertz, 1000 hertz per uh, 1000 hertz frequency. So, but then um, if there is high, a lot of uh, noise levels are there, then acceleration, which is a uh, second order uh, effect, that is preferable because that is very sensitive to the, um, the structural um, uh, response rather than the environmental response. Uh, and before we get into the electronic uh, gauges, there is already historically, there's a lot of mechanical gauges which are existing for measurement, uh, principally for deflection measurements. Uh, for example, the Whitmore gauge, uh, was very reliable and low cost. Uh, it's still available in several places uh, for long term strain measurements. Basically, you have two reference points that are fixed onto the structural element. And we look at a, we have a high pressure dial, or you have some sort of graph or rule between the two, which uh, indicates the relative displacement or relative motion between the reference points. And then basically, we can measure up to 10 inch, and uh, the accuracies are up to a few tens of uh, microns. So, so it's quite good for large scale, uh, you know, structures it's still used for those sort of things. So you have the uh, fixed uh, points, two fixed reference points, and you have the piston and the, you know, the dial shows the um, deflection or between the relative deformation between the two points. Then we have something called the scratch gate, which basically you have a recording disc of uh, either, blah, either brass or some um, metal, um, which uh, is, is, is attached to a pin. And then there is a scratching mechanism which scratches the acceleration history or the trace history or the deformation history on a, on a graph made of this material, a metal plate. And uh, that's a very uh, primitive way of making measurements. We have other mechanical gauges like tilt meters, which look at uh, rotation uh, or tilt uh, with respect to a vertical axis, uh, usually defined by gravity, because you have, in many cases, we have fluid filled tilt meters. And these are very, uh, very, very accurate. Uh, there are others which have, uh, you know, uh, um, Electric transduction and optical methods are also there. Now we, people are coming up with fabric brag uh, tiltometers. So there are several types. Um, and basically, they use acceleration of gravity to actuate the transducer. And uh, they are useful for monitoring the tilt or rotation of large structures, bridge piers, dams, uh, very large, huge amount of concrete, mass concrete structures. These are various types of tilt meters. You can see this starting from individual, you know, protractor type, um, inclinometer type tilt meters, all the way up to very, uh, uh, very complex tiltometers. And then we have vibrating strain gauges. Basically, uh, we all know that the frequency of vibration of a wire is very, very sensitive to the length of the wire. So as the length of the, or the um, tension between the wire of the wire changes, as the length of the wire changes, it changes the frequency of the uh, output signal, which can be calibrated and to a certain, and we can find out what is the stretch in the wire when it is stretched between two fixed points, which are moving relative to each other. <clears throat> And then we have uh, this is uh, this is a this is the actual circuit of the vibrating wire strain gauges. Basically, we look at uh, electromagnetic uh, electromechanical induction, um, and then there is a resonance in the structure. And it's uh, basically, uh, however, what happens is that these are large. The the length of the wire needs to be large in order to be uh, 
sufficiently accurate and sensitive. So this is good for long term uh, huge structures like dams, where the cost can also be justified. <laughs> And then we have these optical devices, basically looking at uh, overlaid grids and also uh, looking at some sort of vernier effect and, uh, you know, Moira fringe enhancement. So you can you can see here that you have two uh, plates which are uh, fixed on either side of a crack and there is a, a grid which was aligned uh, prior. And now you can see that there is slight misalignment which shows that there is also not just a a uh, tensile crack opening, but also a certain rotation uh, you can make out. So these sort of things are very useful manually and they are still used in operational environments for structural health monitoring and maintenance. So then we come to the resistance uh, strain gauge, which is what we are all familiar with. And uh, I will not go into detail, but we know that the uh, when the wire, when a fine wire is pulled, it's due to Poisson's ratio effect, uh, the area changes, the length increases, the area reduces, uh, or vice versa, if it is in compression area increases, length reduces. But this changes the resistance of the wire, which can be very accurately calibrated. And also, this we find out that this is also a function of temperature as well. So uh, this is a typical strain gauge, and we can see that Rather than a wire, we have a foil. This is very thin cross-section etching on the on the strain gauge. Um, and then it causes a small but measurable change in the resistance across the two terminals. The copper-coated tabs uh, measure the resistance across this uh, wire. And this is the Wheatstone bridge, which is the fundamental engine for all measurements. Basically, any physical quantity that you want to measure, uh, any physical measurement uh, data acquisition system will have a Wheatstone bridge in it. Basically, uh, this is uh, using, uh, you know, this looks at the balance of resistances, voltages across a circuit, across the two legs of a circuit. And there is a proportionality as long as the uh, uh, voltage and the, uh, the, the uh, resistances are linear. So there's a uh, constant that converts, you know, the, the strain to the, the voltage into the micro strain uh, along with the, and you input this into a uh, signal amplifier, uh, which amplifies the signal, a signal conditioner, which filters everything. And then uh, we get it a reading, we can get a reading either stored or look at it on the oscilloscope. So for example, this sort of, uh, transducer. So it's sort of like a transducer, but it does not convert one form of energy into another uh, directly, but as a uh, agent uh, resistance uh, acts uh, and it is calibrated to the strain in this particular case. So then we come up to come to what is called a linear variable displacement transducer. Many of you have must have seen this in the labs where we do, where there is long deformations large deformations, and we want to take electronic measurements of the deformations. So LVDTs are capable of very high resolutions, uh, and they are also capable of a large range. Uh, so basically, uh, it, it works on the principle um, of that there is a primary coil which induces voltage and currents in a uh, secondary coil. The primary coil moves like a piston in the core of a cylinder, hollow cylinder. Uh, and then uh, that creates a uh, EMF uh, secondary. So this is what, what we see. Uh, there's an induced voltage in the secondary coils based on the deformation X. And this piston is displaced and there is induction. And then there is a uh, secondary coil. Secondary coils are there. And then we are measuring the uh, differential voltage. Now, coming to accelerometers, there are several types of accelerometer. If we focus on uh, the, uh, the measurement type, in which case we are looking at just measuring acceleration, uh, then you have the primitive, um, on the most uh, easily um, available uh, strain gauge accelerometers. Then we have the 
very advanced MEMS, uh, which are also capacitive and piezoresistive. And then we have the fabric brag, uh, the fiber brag uh, uh, gratings, piezoelectric, uh, servo mechanical uh, accelerometer, servo electrical, and capacitive uh, accelerometer. So there's a wide range available based on different principles. Uh, basically, they are used for safety. Uh, for example, when you want to look at uh, triggering airbag deployments in vehicles, uh, monitoring, uh, you know, shock in uh, nuclear reactors, measuring static acceleration, uh, you know, in a car you want to measure vibration of an object, the orientation, tilt of an object, all these things can be measured by uh, accelerometers, which are having a lot of uh, applications in industry, entertainment, sports, education, research, as well as safety. So even cell phones have accelerometers these days, um, and you know washing machines also. So just to name a few types of components and electrical uh, things. So the strain gauge based accelerometer is one of the simplest accelerometers, and there is a uh, mass. A precisely measured mass, which has a and a stiffness element. In this case, is shown as a cantilever beam, and then the strain gauge is bonded to the surface, top and bottom surface, to remove the effect of axial loading, uh, axial deformation, and to include only bending deformation modes. So then, what happens is that there is uh, this can be measured as a uh, change, time versus change in the strain uh, and the corresponding time versus change in the resistance, which can be, again, using a calibration factor converted into acceleration once it is calibrated to a given benchmark. So this is another, this is the same thing, uh, just a different diagram. So a resistance is a potentiometer. Basically, a variable resistance is a potentiometer. And the, uh, again, we have a driving mass and uh, usually the frequency is less than 30 hertz because the mass has to vibrate. Uh, so it's useful for low frequency vibration measurements, which means that usually seismometers, large accelerometers, those sort of things will be using uh, uh, this resistance or potentiometric accelerometers. Then we have something called the uh, Hall effect. Uh, it's also based on spring mass system. And here the signal voltage is produced, the time varying signal is produced due to a change in the magnetic field of the magnet, uh, which is attached to the seismic mass. So there's a spring mass system uh, which vibrates with the acceleration. Uh, again, this is uniaxial. Um, and then uh, the mass, uh, the, the voltage depends on how close the mass, uh, how close the magnet is to the circuit. And the output uh, voltage is calibrated based on uh, you know, on that fact, and it, in terms directly, indirectly, it becomes calibrated to acceleration. Then we have capacitance-based uh, accelerometer, which measures the distance between a proof mass and two plates of a capacitance, and the two uh, so the, uh, that can be calibrated to the uh, acceleration. Similar to uh, what we saw in strain gauge uh, or potentiometer-based accelerometers, we have piezo-resisting accelerometers, uh, which in fact, they generate their own signal. Whereas in case of a resistance-based uh, um, device, you need to have a voltage input and output, and you're looking at the current uh, and the voltage uh, differential between the across the resistance. Whereas in a piezo-resistive accelerometer, it generates its own signal. Uh, the principle is very similar to what we see for uh, resistive or potentiometric uh, accelerometers. But in this case, it's very uh, uh, useful for high shock acceleration um, applications up to 1000 G. Um, and then they have limited high frequency response. That's a disadvantage. Now, in servo-based uh, accelerometers, we have a flexure pendulum, and which is suspended in a magnetic coil. And again, this is very similar to the Hall effect uh, uh, accelerometer. Only thing is the um, motion can be uh, 
slightly different. It may not be uniaxial in this case. You may have several, uh, you can have several axes measured simultaneously. It has high sensitivity. Uh, it is a lot of linearity and high, high resolution, and you can also calibrate it. Um, so it's useful. Another is the MEMS-based accelerometer. Uh, this also is a sort of a compound. Uh, it has, it, it's based on several principles. In fact, you have these fixed plates between which a spring and mass uh, is basically moving. So MEMS is not really the principle, but the this it, it alludes to the size and the manufacturing process which is required for generating the axle or creating the accelerometric device. Because in this case, the, uh, the accelerometers are very small. So it's micro, -mecha micro electromechanical systems. Uh, but uh, the principle is very similar to what we saw in the capacitive uh, accelerometers. So the usually they are used as a, using a capacitive sensing principle. Um, you have the proof mass with plates, and these act as the the these beams act as the spring, and this central portion is the mass. You have these fixed plates which act as the um, reference, which create the um, between the plates. You have the capacitance being measured, move, and then. Um, <clears throat> Deflection is measured in terms of capacitive changes, acceleration, and these sort of things are measured in terms of the capacitive changes. There are several applications to MEMS everywhere. They are applicable. They are these is embedded in every single item that you see, from your cell phone to aircraft, all the way. Uh, and then they have very good uh, properties when they are low cost, low power. Uh, you know, they have very high, good, uh, you know, impact and shock resistance, a lot of stabilization, low noise. You know, they are not sensitive to vibration. Um, and then we have certain ranges within which, for example, uh, in terms of our particular application, in terms of structural health uh, monitoring or Internet of Things, uh, we have, uh, you know, plus or minus 200G. Uh, and then we have a sort of a... Uh, you know, uh, sampling rate of a uh, couple of kilohertz. Now, we also come to the FBG, fiber grating, fiber bracket grating uh, based accelerometer, wherein uh, you look at the relative difference between two gratings uh, and you look at the, uh, you have a, uh, you have a baseline, uh, uh, reflected wavelength before and after the displacement, relative displacement between those two gratings. And that wavelength uh, can be converted to, the difference in, that shift in wavelength can be converted into uh, strain. Uh, and we can, that allows us to measure strain versus time. Uh, here you can see that there is an inert mass, cantilever, FBG sensor. Um, so it's free from, it has several uh, advantages, especially in terms of uh, its free freedom from electromagnetic interference. You know, it has uh, very good transmission uh, capabilities. Uh, it's a very small light, and it's possible to permanently incorporate them into structure. One of the disadvantages is that it needs a wire. It has to have a very long wire um, connection to the this thing. Um, but it's very good, uh, very wide frequency range, uh, very low, ultra low to several kilohertz, high sensitivity, high acceleration resistance, shock and impact resistance is also very high. And like we said, we have to select our sensors on the basis of what applications uh, we have. Uh, for, uh, and we have to look into the sensor characteristics, what are the environmental conditions, what are the economic uh, requirements also, because in the end, economy, uh, the cost, uh, availability, lifetime cabling requirements, these are very important, apart from just the environmental factors like the power consumption, interference, range, uh, you know, uh, the kind of loading that is coming on, that is also important. And then we have the sensor characteristics of sensitivity, dynamic range, which we have already discussed. 
you know, the frequency range, noise floor, meaning uh, what is the minimal noise, if noise it can detect, uh, and those sort of things. And what are the conditional requirements? How much electronics over and above just the sensor is required to be able to extract a signal, a, a reasonable, repeatable, accurate signal from the sensor. That's also very important. So all these three things are interrelated um, all to each other. Now, in terms of specifications for selecting an accelerometer, we have to look at what is the dynamic range, which is the maximum amplitude of the uh, accelerometer before it becomes uh, non-linear or before it is get it gets clipped, right? Uh, so it's usually uh, specified in uh, G's. And then there is the sensitivity, whether we look at uh, in terms of millivolt per G, what is, the, what is the voltage output that is uh, given in terms of the signal per every G? In, and then we look at the frequency response um, and the sensitivity, uh, how many different axes is the sensitive, is the accelerometer sensitive to? We usually have uniaxial, biaxial, or triaxial accelerometers. Uh, so each axis, extra axis, allows detecting acceleration along it along that particular accelerometer. These are used in a lot of games. Uh, even our cell phones have these. And then we also look at the mass uh, and size and mass of the object being tested. Because the accelerometer, when, for example, you put the accelerometer on the tip of a cantilever beam, the accelerometer itself, uh, if it is if it is not selected properly, itself will it itself will cause some deflection in the cantilever. And it will add to the mass of the cantilever. So, uh, depending on uh, that, whether we have the theory to, there is some theory to compensate for that uh, in terms of the vibration effect of this additional mass at the tip of the cantilever. But for more complex uh, situations, uh, we don't want the size and mass or even the stiffness of the uh, sensor to affect the structure itself. So the measurement is uh, uh, of the F-light frequency uh, should be less than the natural frequency of the accelerometer. For example, if an accelerometer uh, uh, has to measure, or if any device in that case, uh, in any case has to measure, say, 1 hertz, uh, something that is varying at, say, 10 hertz, uh, let us say, then it has to have a sampling rate of at least 20, 20 hertz or twice the sampling rate in order to be able to detect something without any aliasing or bias, uh, which is called the, and this twice the frequency is called the Nyquist frequency. Um, in terms of selection of the technologies, we have to look at what is the, firstly, why do you want to do the sensing? Um, objectives, what are the objectives for the sensing? You want to look at condition assessment, you want to do research, you want to validate your design assumptions, or you want to look at the cost implication uh, of a certain design, or you want to look at the hazard, say, or the safety aspects of a certain particular design. So that's why you have sensors. Or you want to look at what is the environmental hazard at a particular location. And then uh, the other factors for sensor selection is type of structure. Uh, you know, that depends on the uh, type of structure to be monitored. So what sort of, whether it is a steel structure, whether it is an overground, underground structure, whether it is located inside water, these sort of things uh, will generally dictate what type of sensor. Also, what are the quantities to measure, uh, whether you are measuring strain or whether you want stress or whether you want temperature or what, what are the things, pressure, what is being measured. Uh, then you have the physical attributes of the sensor itself, meaning how what is the size weight, but also how rugged it is, whether it, it can withstand the temperatures or the stresses or strains or displacements or accelerations uh, enough, uh, long enough to give reasonably uh, good service life and measure the um, uh, health of the structure over a long enough period. Uh, and then these also can affect the accuracy of the structures if there is an interaction like we talked about earlier. And then uh, sensor properties, uh, you know, in terms of the sensitivity, uh, bandwidth, uh, these are also range of the instrument. These are very important. 
and we set operational uh, requirements for example in harsh conditions whether you know there is acidic alkaline high temperature high humidity the sensor should be able to work within the uh, chosen uh, location apart from all this uh, the mundane thing of cost the total cost also becomes a become a very big uh, factor in all decision making we cannot have very high uh, all purpose uh, highly accurate sensors all the time because they are costly and they require a lot of uh, experience and uh, that itself uh, requires a lot of training um, and an industrial base that produces the sensors with the uh, required precision apart from that we also have the number of sensors and where how many sensors where to put so all these things are required because we cannot put infinite number of sensors on a structure and we have to choose where we want to put the sensor which means that we are choosing where not to put the sensor also so that is a important factor decision making factor so this is a these are a few graphs which enable uh, sensor selection you see in this case you have resolution versus sensing range uh in another graph you have the sensing frequency versus sensing range uh you know for uh, different kinds of uh, types of sensors in this case the first graph is uh, the uh, the displacement sensors you have these all these very different types of sensors so these graphs basically enable us to first decide what is the sensing range that we want what is the sensing frequency that we want what is the resolution that we want and we can basically find from these graphs what is the type of measurement sensor that we need these are the various graphs and we also have stiffness versus sensing range sensing frequency versus temperature operating temperature for example uh sensing range in terms of the resistance versus the uh, the frequency um, for example if we take this particular accelerometer sensor right resolution versus sensing range for accelerometer what we see here is that for a sensing range of 10 power minus 4 to 10 power 6 g right and then we see a resolution uh, in terms of uh, differential measurement of g 10 power minus uh, 6 to 10 power minus 3 1 and 10 power 3 so so suppose we want to look at something uh, in the range of uh, 1 to 10 power uh, of 1 g to 10 power 3 g then uh, and we want a resolution of say 10 power minus 3 and we can come like this and, and then we look at where it intersects this graph and we say that servo force balance uh, or a capacitive um, or a capacitive accelerometer is going to be quite useful for this particular application so we can find from these graphs these are very useful graphs um, and i'll show them in the we have these in the references i'll show them where they are and you can all use this for sensor selection this is very important and i found that this is a very useful graph set of graphs uh another example for example we want to look at the uh, resolution versus sensing range for example here we have meters which is the displacement and what is the resolution in uh, again in meters from all the way from 10 to the power of minus 12 femtometers to 10 to the power of 3 meters to kilometer range so if for example for our usual cases where we want to look at uh, you know brittle materials like cement we want something that is 10 power minus 6 uh, uh resolution which is 1 micron resolution range and then what sort of uh, sensing range do we need we need something that is between 1 micron to 1 meter uh, maybe uh, you know that sort of deflection might be say let's say uh, one uh, say a centimeter range of deflection so here we look at the 10 power minus 6 Uh, vertical axis go all the way and look at where it intersects the 10 power minus 2 which is the centimeter axis and here we see uh, things like linear potentiometers we have uh, clip gauges 
we have lvdts in this range we have so many uh, you know fiber optic uh, also in this particular range so that is that is providential because this particular range is the most common range you see lot of intersection that is because primarily most of these were originally des designed to make measurements in this particular range that's why you have lot of these overlapping here now if you go back into this 10 power minus 6 micron to you know 10 power minus 9 nanometer range where you for example afm and uh, scanning tunnel microscopy and the resolution has to be again in 1 billionth of a micro uh, 1 billionth of a meter then you have these uh, afm uh, you you know you, you look at uh, capacitance micrometry these sort of things so uh, these give you an idea of where uh, what first you can make out what is the application range and resolution required and from this you can choose what sort of sensor or uh, you know um, framework that you want and you have this for several different uh, physical uh, quantities displacement acceleration temperature and here you see stiffness and mass also. Um, and here, this final graph shows us the approximate uh, cost versus uh, mass for accelerometers, for capacitive piezoelectric or uh, piezoresistive accelerometers. So if you, if you look at the cost and the mass, so we, we saw that the mass uh, has an effect when we go to the, uh, I don't think, here, um, it's not here. Uh, but when you're looking at the mass of the accelerometer itself, uh, we see that if, if it is a capacitive uh, accelerometer, the, the cost reduces quite drastically when it is in the hundreds of uh, gram range. And then it increases again for larger uh, masses. Similarly, this piezoelectric has a low cost somewhere around uh, in the hundreds of uh, uh, grams. Piezoresistive uh, costs are very high, generally. So piezoelectric or capacitive are what we are using generally, in most cases. Piezoresistive are used for very low, uh, you know, uh, low mass applications. And then we look at the sensing versus accuracy, displacement accelerometers, force sensors, temperature sensors. We look at the entire range of accuracy that we want. For example, uh, in displacement sensors, you see that there is, uh, you know, the range of uh, linearity versus the accuracy. Uh, there has to be some sort of, as the sensing range increases, we are looking at uh, the, this sort of behavior. So there is a lot of scatter for displacement. Uh, force also, you have uh, some amount of scatter, but pretty much these are linear. But when you look at uh, temperatures, there is a slightly wider uh, uh, accuracy. So the accuracy of temperature uh, ranges. So accuracy depends a lot on the temperature range that you want to look at in this case. So placements of sensors um, is based. Now we have to, once we select our sensors, we have to decide where to place, how many to place on the structure, right? So two basic methods for placing the sensors or the transducers is one is the physics-based method, uh, wherein we look at the, we create a model of the component uh, and uh, select the configuration that is most sensitive to the loads and the damage. So we create a finite element model, look at the uh, nodes and anti-nodes locations where we want to place the accelerometer. That sort of thing is, uh, a physics-based technique. In terms of data-driven, basically we are not interested uh, on how the cantilever beam vibrates. We are just looking at uh, trial and error placement of the sensor and looking at where we get the best FRS. So that sort of is called the data-driven uh, trial and error kind of technique. Uh, the basic rule in positioning or locating sensors is that basically the damage mechanism the and the physical quantity that we want to measure should be observable or sensible by the sensors. It should be directly measured or indirectly measured 
Uh, and there is always, we know that, you know, there is always trade-offs in performance. We have to be aware of those things. We cannot have very highly accurate hundreds of sensors because then there is a cost associated and not only cost, how do you uh, reduce the data into something that is, uh, you know, that will tell us uh, something about the state of the structure. There are a lot of issues. So, um, lot of literature and research has gone into determining the optimum locations of sensor placement. Basically, um, you most of these rely on the on assessing all the locations uh, of the candidate sensor. Look at uh, you look at uh, some sort of optimization, minimization, maximization problem wherein you want uh, you have an objective function uh, and you. Uh, look at the constraints. Each of these constraints might be a location. And then basically you delete those locations the, that uh, perform, that don't perform well until only the uh, required number of uh, measurement locations are, uh, remain. So you have various types of uh, approaches. Uh, there's an entire list of things here. I won't read it out. Uh, but you can see that this is a very well established area and it's still there's a lot of research in terms of genetic algorithms, uh, animal-based, uh, you know, leapfrog, ant colony, uh, you know, all these algorithms are there, uh, which are used for optimizing the location of the sensor. So um, there are other practical aspects, apart from the theoretical aspects. Uh, one is, where do you, for example, in a bridge structure, uh, you have to apply your uh, sensors in key locations. For example, if you see a, a simply supported span, we obviously know the at least three locations where the sensors can be kept, you know, at the near the supports and at the mid span. Immediately, that is quite obvious. So, in, in such cases, we, there are other factors which are required. For example, how do you need three sensors? Can we get away with one? That sort of thing is, uh, this. those sort of decisions are required. So um, you have to have the appropriate type of sensor. It has to be located at the, uh, it has to be kept at key locations wherein it can measure the, uh, wherein the, the measurement at that particular location represents the response of the whole structure. So that should be sensitive, it should be, uh, inclusive of the uh, damage that is occurring and it should be sensitive to all the global effects. So those sort of, as and when your sensor, number of sensors reduces, their sensitivity to global damage should increase. So the validation of, uh, you know, uh, you may use this for certain, like we talked about earlier, design, design validation, right? Uh, and monitoring the structural condition, development of the you know, future uh, models. Uh, also for model validating finite element models, you can carry out structural performance assessments. And there are also something called intercalibration of measurement results. So you have various types of sensors and you want to look at how well each of them measure. Uh, for example, you can have a, a thermocouple and see if it is measuring strain as well, just like you have a resistance which measures strain and temperature. So just an example, those sort of things, studies uh, use this sort of interdependence of physical parameters. So then uh, structural health monitoring usually includes permanently installed sensors. And these, are, these have to be placed at what you call ideal locations. So, uh, and in order to use that, you have to, if it's a bridge or a structure that is subjected to vibrations or dynamic forces, you can take into account the mode shapes and natural frequencies. And then uh, usually these modal methods are quite uh, well established and we are very familiar with these sort of finite element models, which can enable us to predict the dynamic uh, properties and the location of the modal, uh, you know, the the node, anti-node, or, you know, the uh, these locations can be predicted very easily. So what happens is that these become uh, tedious and ineffective uh, in, uh, in the mid-frequency range where you have 
high number of modes. Lot of modes are there. Lot of modal density is there. Meaning, it is very unclear that as the number of modes are important, you need to include lot of modes, and the damage might be very small. So you need to go into higher frequency. So how do you detect where to place the accelerometer? Where is the anti node? Where is the node? So it becomes very difficult to decide because these now are not a single point. These are not discrete anymore. Rather, they are spread over certain areas. So those are some of the issues. Um, in terms of the levels of structural health monitoring, um, we look at firstly the level one, which is the lowest level. Most of us are familiar with that. Is confirming the presence of damage. Level one. Whether there is damage or not. Level two, which is slightly higher, is also tells us where the damage is located and what is the orientation of the damage. Level three tells us how much damage has occurred, and level four and five are basically into mitigation aspect. Basically, you're look in level four, you're looking at controlling or delaying the damage of the growth, and level five, you're looking at the residual capacity of the structure. So, level one. And two are basically the diagnostics, and level five tells us the prognosis. Just like in medical terms, we use uh, in diagnosis, you detect what is happening. In prognosis, you tell what is going to happen and what is the residual, uh, you know, effect of such and such damage. So, <clears throat> uh, in level one, uh, as such, um, we confirm the presence of damage. Uh, you know, we monitor certain properties of the structure over the time. Um, and then we look at, uh, you know, basically wave propagation techniques can help when there is a lot of high frequencies in this. And we are looking at stiffness changes in most structural uh, systems. In level two, uh, there is, it's a bit more difficult because you need to identify the location. So you need a lot of detection algorithms uh, and it, uh, Basically, we are looking at uh, the requirement for algorithm. We don't need a baseline. In level three, look at the uh, intensity. It is very difficult, actually, uh, because of the here. What happens is the severity of damage. Uh, we start looking into the fracture uh, characteristics of the material. The material strength characteristics come into picture. So it's not very easy. It, again, it's a uh, to, to evaluate the severity of damage uh, has to be done in several ways. Uh, there are certain uh, newer ways coming up, like uh, digital image correlation, which help out. And I'll talk about that soon. Um, um, there is the uh, level four, which you know we talk about. Uh, uh, again, level four and five are more towards mitigation. So this is a structural health monitoring. Uh, you know, this is the overall framework for a data handling system. A typical data handling system, you have sensing system, you have sensors, environmental conditions, and analog data conditioning. You have data processing, data storage, data interpretation, which again leads to maintenance activities. So that's the entire structural health monitoring system, which includes human beings also, sensors, data, processing, data storage, humans, environment, all of these are part of the system. And in terms of a data analysis framework, you have this uh, you know, data that is transformed into either a time or frequency um, uh, analysis, and you extract the features, the signal that require, uh, you compare it with the baseline, and you extract the difference between this signal and the previous one. And then you detect, locate, and quantify uh, identify damage and loads using that. For example, now here is a uh, integrated example of an integrated framework for a bridge structure. Then you have the data from various um, sensors all across the bridge. And then you also do data processing. You get the knowledge. You do numerical simulation. You update your numerical finite element models. You also can do damage diagnosis and prognosis, looking at remaining life prediction. And how do you optimally repair the uh, plan for repairing? So what are the challenges? Uh, most uh, challenges uh, in vibration-based methods 
is that damage is a local phenomena and dynamic response is a global phenomena so how do you correlate these two so uh, and another is that in many situations uh, you know the uh, the data from the damaged systems is not available uh, then uh, the sensors have the entire structural hazmatic system has to be sensitive to the small damages so you have to choose properly what is the required sensing system and the number and locations of sensors have to be optimally chosen apart from all these environmental aspects you also have to have the long time scales usually for large structures the sensors have to be also survivable over those large time periods of time otherwise you change your baseline every time you change the sensor if the sensor dies you have to replace it uh, again you have to start creating a new baseline so all the previous ones unless there is a overlap between these and the other sensors that previous data is gone so there are a lot of issues manage data management issues also apart from that you have non technical issues like cost uh, economic benefits life safety benefits uh, technical expertise you know that sort of thing um, and you in terms of the technical challenges you have to have the measurements you have to have the frequency at which you want to measure what are the kinds of structures geometry that you are want to measure all these are big challenges and hurdles so i will skip some of these uh, slides in the interest of time i see that we are coming at 4:10 uh, we have up to 4:30 i believe sir so am i correct sir okay i'll carry on got you sir right so so geometry imposes a lot of technical challenges because in some cases we cannot access the location the ideal location may not be accessible uh, also the spatial resolution for very large structures uh, you have a huge dam and the cracking is happening only in certain regions how do you measure that so the damage is local the response we want to measure uh, are we we are fondly hoping that we can measure the global response change so there is a slight mismatch always between these two so that's a big challenge um the way to overcome is to identify beforehand what sort of um, what would be the most probable locations and place your sensors in those locations uh, what more what would be the most probable location of damage and put your sensors in there and um <clears throat> so in terms of measuring measurement timing aspect we have you know duration of the sensing what is the uh, frequency what is the long term uh, usage robustness of the sensors and the data acquisition system comes into picture and also you want to look at extreme if you want to sense extreme events the the robustness not only of the sensor but also of the data acquisition system comes into picture also triggering sampling rate these are again looking at uh, certain aspects so here we come to our first case study of a structural health monitoring system this is a bridge in china which is called the singma suspension bridge which is about uh, more than 2 km continuous and length and this basically has a lot of sensors wind and structural health monitoring system integrated system it has 283 sensors of all sort of types you have anemometers servo type accelerometers temperature gauges strain gauges global positioning systems displacement transducers you have water level uh, rising transducers dynamic vein motion station data acquisition station all these things are monitoring the traffic load the railway load the wind fatigue temperature geometry global dynamic features all these things are being monitored so this is one example of an integrated system which is measuring everything possible at certain locations which are optimized so this is the structural health monitoring system this is a practical actually working structural health monitoring system so you have these modules module 1 is the sensory system data acquisition system data processing you have the structural health data management system and the health evaluation system right and then all these are updated using finite element models you have instant display reports uh, you have expert data expert opinion bridge rating reports bridge responses all these things uh, again you have the bridge design criteria 
and monitoring criteria all these things are interwoven interlinked it is like a single management information mis system for that single grid you also have maintenance and inspection system similarly you have another case study of the canton tower again this is in china uh, wherein this is a uh, 454 meter uh, height uh, main tower with a spire on top of it and it's it has a very variable cross section now they are using uh, industrial digital cameras to to basically it has has other sensors but the industrial digital camera is used for overall global um orientation so you can see so many different sensors are there uh, you have vibration accelerometer corrosion sensor vibrating string strain gauge sensors optic fiber optic strain gauge sensors at various level a total of 12 cross sections have been um, selected for monitoring uh, these uh, accelerometers and these were determined by finite element analysis at the critical construction stages as well as the actual stages so what we see is that the structures when they are being constructed are at their most vulnerable so a structure is highly probable the most probability of collapse of a structure is when it is being constructed so you can see here it has 527 sensors total now when we look at another case study uh, so this talks these two case studies talked about what is the kind of infrastructure required for health monitoring of a structure proper health monitoring of a structure and this case is a sort of a cautionary tale about our dependency on the modal parameter based uh, structural health monitoring wherein the researchers uh, took a steel girder bridge and uh, in usa and they put various levels of damage into the structure and as you see with increasing damage you should get decrease in frequency right as the stiffness decreases because of dam increasing damage the frequency should also decrease in hertz right so what they saw was that in the first two cases the first two damage levels damage level 1 and 2 the frequency actually increased so this was counter counter intuitive um what they found out later on is that the ambient temperature of the bridge the thermal expansion uh, processes they change the stiffness of the structure far more than the damage of the girder so we have to be very careful when we do studies of this nature we have to make sure that the ambient or the environmental factors don't change don't have a significant effect on the uh, dynamic characteristics of the structure in this case they looked at uh, another bridge wherein the natural frequency varied 5% during a 24 hour test so that was again because of uh, you know thermal changes temperature changes can cause those uh, problems uh, this is a case study which i did uh, uh, this is a what uh, this is a work which i did for my uh, phd thesis as part of a minor part of my phd thesis we looked at full scale testing of low rise rc buildings and i was looking at the progressive collapse resistance of uh, uh, historic rc structures so this is a finite element model and we basically removed the structure the columns on the basis of the gsa uh, progressive collapse scenarios case 1 and case 2 corner removal and the mid mid uh, outer column removal so we saw that the structures were pretty redundant very quite redundant it was actually designed by an architect so he made sure it put in more extra steel so nothing happened to the structure when you removed the corner column it is still intact then we used this this particular uh, shear mechanical shear to hit on top of the slab only then it was able to collapse so we were able to get a sort of an idea of the energy and you can see on this this side column removal nothing has happened to the structure it's quite redundant and the displacements are far low so in this case we 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 put accelerometers uh uniaxial accelerometers on various orientations to pick up the um the accelerations and we had a huge uh, uh 12 pound hammer uh, which has a force transducer to excite the structure and we were able to get based on this this uh, sort of equipment 
frequency response and time signals we were able to get the um, data uh, on the change in the structure's natural frequencies so you, here you see this amount of damage has caused this amount of shift in the natural frequencies you see if 5% all at the same time we made sure that there was not too much of a temperature effect and you can see that the this is damage one baseline this is baseline this is damage one and damage three so here we removed in this particular column each column removal was one level of damage not much different so frequency shift by itself is uh, you have to deal with it very carefully so this brings us to our uh, uh, you know currently uh, ongoing research which has been funded by imprint uh, wherein we are uh, developing a simple and robust non contact method for rapid uh, structural health monitoring uh, using digital image correlation so our idea is to provide and develop a simple cost effective and very practical imaging based technique for monitoring damage in large structures uh, bridges dams nuclear uh, defense aerospace structures so we have to develop a system that is robust and simple enough to be used in the field for example here we have an application where we take a picture of the bridge and using our algorithms we estimate the remaining capacity in the components and grade the status and on the basis we can also uh, add up all those and estimate the overall state of the bridge used the based on the cumulative damage so this is a, a brief a schematic of the system we use a speckle pattern and digital cameras and we do a little bit of photogrammetric data analysis as well and digital image correlation and then we come up with a go no go classification of the structure whether it is red or green or yellow and uh, we also looking into tying this with the ibms bridge database so these are some of the laboratory experiments that we have conducted uh, using the speckle patterns various types of speckle patterns and uh, we have also come up with uh, various optimized speckle patterns which have have dual purpose uh, for this and this data fairly matched what we get from dial gauge and lvdt data uh, fairly matched to what we got from our digital image correlation using this cameras uh, and then in order to get uh, correlate the strains with damage we came up with uh, we had to do a lot of uh, artificial neural network uh, processing to come up with uh, various uh, damage indices uh, based on the curvatures of the Uh, of the uh, critical components and the strains in the critical so uh, this brings us to what are the because the field is evolving we need certain standards and codes in recent decades several countries have uh, adopted developed standards european union has developed uh, samco uh, and uh, again in the us in the uk they have uh, you know recommendations for quantity of sensors positioning of sensors what sort of algorithms and what sort of processing systems to use and this is a list of the various types of uh, structural health monitoring standards and codes from you know all the way from australia china canada european union uk switzerland us they all have uh, various types uh, various levels of uh, codes Uh, some of these are prescriptive some of these are uh, descriptive codes um, and this is the, the this is an excerpt from the new uh, recently developed chinese code uh, which looks at uh, again it's a prescriptive uh, code which gives us the ranges uh, and parameters for using certain uh, certain uh, physical quantities and what are the ranges for the sensors Uh, which are employed for getting that data for example strain sensors should have 30% full range uh, and 80% full range above the static strain measurement and it should have a dynamic strain range of two times the maximum predicted value it should be able to get it should have a large range 
and uh, dynamic response. Similarly, you have data collection, transmission, processing, and data management uh, standards. Uh, it's a it's one of it's a it's a latest uh, standard by the Chinese government. I think uh, in, in uh, uh, consideration and consultation with their local bodies uh, and uh, professional organizations. Similar uh, codes are coming up in the USA uh, as well. This is a technical, uh, you know, this is an overview of the process. Basically, you do a first level safety evaluation, and then uh, if the structural global response is abnormal, then what to do? So this is a sort of a decision tree. Um, if the local response is abnormal, what to do? If there is a second level safety evaluation required, uh, whether there is a bridge, and all these things uh, to decide whether there is a bridge damage or not, whether the structural damage is happening or not. And then in the future, uh, as the technology evolves, also estimating the reliability, predicting the remaining life service, also for determining the optimal times for inspection and repair. So there's a huge multidisciplinary area of study. Um, and we also need uh, the, the you know, advanced uh, sensing systems uh, wherein we are more reliable. Uh, the sensing system must be more reliable than the structure. And the locations and number of sensors must be optimized. So all these things are still ongoing research. Uh, and you should also focus on developing cost-effective sensing areas. So, and also advanced signal processing techniques are required, which not only distinguish the location and extent, but also what type of damage is happening. Because in a structure where it gets deteriorated or damaged, usually it's not one type of damage. There are several types of damages happening, which, which uh, basically deteriorate the structure. And we also, it can be used for modeling the future load estimates based on the forecasting, what is available, data record and database of the currently uh, you know, occurring loads that will be useful for later on uh, you know the demand estimations and it's also good for predicting and validation of damage models physical models of the structure so uh, there is a requirement for you know a lot of uh, reliability analysis for making management decisions like we said cost and uh, life cycle cost analysis decisions have to be taken. And of course, uh, one very, very important thing is to be able to develop baseline independent methods of structural health monitoring because practically every single structural health monitoring, no matter what, that structural health monitoring system or framework depends on, on getting baseline measurements. You cannot go back in time and say, I'll start from 10 years ago and measure what is the... So if you go to a bridge and put a sensor now, you can only measure what is happening after some days. If you put the sensor on the bridge now, you cannot measure what the bridge's response is right now. Whether it is acceleration, even the dynamic response you will get of the current status only. If you want to see the measurement of deterioration depends on a differential measurement, always. So how to come out of that particular limitation is a very, very big question. It's a very challenging question, baseline independent method. So there is a lot of uh, approaches in which modeling and simulation plays a big part into the structure, uh, into this particular approach. Uh, and then a lot of long-term studies have to be done to, uh, you know, on actual civil structures, because most of these uh, structural health monitoring things have been done on lab scales or models. Very less data is coming from the actual full-scale structures and systems. That has to, once the data is available, that has to be studied. So these are my references, and I thank you for this opportunity to present uh, my perspective on structural health monitoring. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a very, very enlightening and uh, presentation on structural modeling. Uh, you have covered all the aspects of uh, 
uh, monitoring uh, from sensors, the installation locations, the requirement, the process, the monitoring techniques, and even you have explained with a uh, very thorough case study, sir. We are very thankful to you, sir. sir before we go for questioning and answers, I request our management uh, member, Dr. Director, Dr. Kishor Garu, to speak few words uh, with the participants and the audience. Sir, Kishor, sir. Um, a very good evening to everyone. Um, special, uh, very thanks. Uh, I mean, special thanks to Dr. Tejasvi Garu. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you made us all think, and all the participants were very privileged to hear you, sir. Um, I think I, I was also a part of the, uh, you know, the complete presentation and session that was uh, uh, shown today, and I think it's definitely very useful and. Uh, uh, to help predict and forecast using the uh, technology, you know, integrated uh, with the you know civil infrastructures. So I think there's a lot of, uh, like you have mentioned, I think there's a lot of scope uh, and uh, uh, possibility for the research to be done. And I'm I'm very uh, uh, confident that this session will be helpful to all the participants for uh, you know putting and some more uh, light on uh, how to take things forward in this uh, research area. So thank you. It was a wonderful session, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for firstly providing me an opportunity to talk about uh, uh, this topic. And also, uh, I would like to thank the management for encouraging research at uh, SVNIT. Thank you. Our pleasure, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Isha, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, now the session is open for participants to ask you questions. So any participant what would like to ask a question, you can unmute your mic and you can ask. Sir, yes, please. Introduce yourself, sir. Sir, myself, Pawan uh, Kumar, working as an officer in uh, Sri Rangadeswara College of Engineering and Technology. Sir, you have showed the case study on Canton Tower in uh, China. What are the sensors installed in it and how long they work, sir? Yeah, like we, uh, I can go back to the slide. Uh, there is not one type, but several different types of sensors. In in that case, what 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 we have is including, you know, wind pressure sensors. You have optic fiber optic strain gauges, vibrating wire strain gauges, accelerometers. You also have corrosion sensors because there is a lot of steel in the thing. Uh, you want to measure the corrosion. You have to have vibration wire string gauges, which are longer, which measure the uh, the over a longer baseline. So lots of different types of sensors, six different types of uh, sensors are there and total of about uh, 527 sensors are there. Okay. How long they work, sir? Effectively, ideally, one would like to have, once when uh, sensors have been installed, one would like to have them working over the lifetime of the structure. Okay. <clears throat> That's 50 to 100 years is what we would like them to work, but they don't. Usually in another, in five to 10 years, most of the sensors will be either uh, because of environmental effects or lack of maintenance, they get stripped off. Uh, and uh, usually towards the end of life of the structures, we don't have much data. Okay, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is there any more questions for participants? So we have a few structural engineering uh, faculty also. Yeah. The participants. Any questions from participants? Sir, I explained very interesting case studies. Sir, I have one doubt, sir. Have you have taken uh, that building uh, for uh, only for purpose of your research work, sir? The construction of building and uh, dismantling the building. Yes, Possibly yes, actually. Study. You are correct, sir. Actually, it was a, a 
it was a, a opportunity that i got uh, and uh, at my university in the, at university of mississippi campus they were dismantling the student housing and the married student housing actually so uh, i asked them i took permission to uh, uh, enable dismantling in a specified order in the mechanical shear with a lot of precision and control so that we could see well as the you know different stages of damage when individual columns or beams or elements are removed what is the change in the stiffness of the overall structure so we found that it is not very sensitive sir at least for these sort of structures yeah. sir but that building is only that uh, two i think g plus 2 maximum but uh, the response will be same for uh, g plus uh, n number of floors also sir it will be different uh no uh, it might be different for different structures again it has to be done on a case to case basis uh what i the reason i showed it is to uh, to emphasize that uh different structures you saw the one with the bridge also where there was damage with along with damage what happened is that the frequency actually increased for the first two levels of damage so sometimes uh, the dynamic uh, you have this frf for uh, structural dynamics based structural health monitoring is uh, sometimes non intuitive uh, so we have to take it with a pinch of salt and we have to make sure that other factors are not coming into picture uh, in the case of uh, that particular building which i had was a two story building it was quite stiff it was quite very redundant we found later on it was a very highly redundantly designed structure and i was able to stand beneath that uh, free slab freely you know i'll show that picture the, i was able to the, you see all the columns are cut it has it's a free cantilever slab i was able to stand underneath it so the there was a lot of uh, you know the tie forces in the structure the the redundancy of the force paths in the structure that also changes the the sensitivity of the structure to damage versus frequency shift so that's a very important lesson that we learned Nice. The participants. Any questions from participants? <clears throat> so, whenever you ask a question, please uh, introduce yourself and ask a question. And students are also there, and uh, you can raise few questions in structural engineering. i'm open to any questions please don't hesitate to ask questions oh uh, it's a good can i please ask this opportunity <clears throat> mera several doubts in your mind please raise your questions in my in my classroom i say there is no such thing as a stupid question there is only question or no question please don't hesitate to ask any questions that you have sir ratan sinwas you have some doubt Sir, Ratan Sinwas, they are asking about some doubt. Have any question, Ratan? Please ask. any questions from students sir is open to all of you please ask questions this is very interesting opportunity for you to get your doubts clarified 
it can be any any basic any related to this also is fine doesn't have to be structural health monitoring itself I think uh, there are no doubts, sir. <laughs> sir. Hello? Uh, yeah. Hello? Yeah, nice. Hello? Yes, please. Hello? Yes, yes I can hear you. Yes. Uh, the thermal uh, sensors, how they are useful in the case of construction of house? Uh, you're asking how thermal sensors are useful in construction of the that building, building in the construction of building. Construction of buildings. So myself um, is a myself is Dr. Murthy, Dr. J S N Murthy, professor in uh, Hyderabad. Sir, so actually uh, this is uh, there's a very interesting question you have 